My name is John Weingard. I'm Associate Director here at Eagleton. I teach a course, the Processes of Politics, and most of you have been not showing up much this semester, so I'm, but the class is here, and then there are another 30 or so people, so. Um, so this is a, a, cl a class you're, you're getting to visit, and thank you all for coming. You're all welcome here, and I particularly welcome Governor Jim Florio and uh, Dick McCormick, former Rutgers president, historian right there. And uh, we are filming this event uh, to be on Eagleton's YouTube channel. Uh, so if you weren't going to turn off your cell phone anyway, please do it now. Um, there are people here from another course in congressional politics, and you have to sign some kind of form, and you can do that in the foyer when you leave. And after this program, you're all invited to stay for lunch. So I hope you can do that. Um, this program, it's, it's uh, is a couple of things, but it's mostly part of a program at Rutgers called the Arthur Holland Ethics in Government Program, a program that was set up in memory of Art Holland, who was the mayor of Trenton, New Jersey, the state's capital, from 1959 to 1980, with a slight gap in the middle there. And he became well known in particular for his openness to the public and the ethical standards of his administration. Um, he served as president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and he was a graduate of Rutgers in the class in 1954, and he also went to graduate school here as well. This program was set up in, in, in his memory and to preserve his legacy. It seeks to promote integrity in public affairs and to improve public policy and government practices by seeking ways to replace cynicism and apathy with awareness, understanding, and actions. Art Holland's widow, Betty Holland, was in, an Eagleton Fellow in the first class of Eagleton Fellows in 1958. Their son, Matt, was a fellow here in 1994, and uh, members of the family had hoped to be here but can't be here today and send their regards. Um, this is the third program we've had in this Arthur Holland series this year. The first was um, at, held in, in Atlantic City at the League of Municipalities convention in November with uh, Tom Moran, who's the editorial page writer for the uh, Star-Ledger, and Pete McDonough, who's now a vice president at Rutgers, but in the period it's subject to that talk, was the communications director for Governor Whitman. And they talked about how reporters and people in government and staff interact and, and do that in an integral way. The second program we had, which I know some of you attended, was last or February, I guess, when uh, Arthur Kaplan came and uh, spoke about on a general topic of when gov government and medicine collide and uh, spoke about ethics in, in medicine as well as in government. And this is the third and final program in this for, for this year. Um, I'm very happy to be able to welcome Ted Kaufman here to, to Eagleton. He was, his biography is in the program you all have there. He was uh, on the staff of Senator Joe Biden from 1973 to 1975. For 19 of those years, he was chief of staff to Senator Biden. And when uh, Joe Biden got elected vice president, uh, Ted Kaufman was appointed to fill that Senate seat and was the U.S. Senator from Delaware in 2009 and 2010, where, among other things, he chaired the Congressional Oversight Panel for the Troubled Asset Relief Program, which we all know fondly as TARP. He was a member of the Federal Working Group on Streamlining Paperwork for Executive Nominations, and he is currently a visiting professor at Duke University, a school you may have heard of in the southern part of the country. Um, I consulted, knowing that he was going to be here, with the author of a great book about the Senate called The Last Great Senate, um, who said, um, whose name is Ira Shapiro, and he said, Ted lived out a staffer's fantasy of being elevated to the Senate. And he behaved not only like a real senator, but a great senator by bringing his intellect and passion to bear on one of the biggest problems facing the country. It's a great pleasure to welcome Ted Kaufman. Thank you, John. Um, first, I want to recognize uh, Governor Florio who uh, we spent when I was working for Senator Biden. Senator Biden commuted every day, I commuted every day, and Governor Florio commuted a lot. <laughs> and so we spent a lot of quality time on the train when he was a member of Congress. And uh, President Dick McCormick, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, thank you for coming. It's, uh, it's great to be here. 
uh, I'm not running for anything. I'm not selling anything. <laughs> so what you're going to hear is exactly what I feel. <laughs> so you may not agree or disagree, but this is, this is it. Um, I've learned this. I, I've been teaching for 25 years at the Duke Law School, and the students there pretty much beat it out of me. So I kind of stick to what's true. The other, second thing is, I may be a sound a little uh, strange at times. I had to sit up last night and watch Duke beat Wisconsin, <laughs> which, was the, which is the high point. I mean, this is the high point of my day, but <laughs> that, that was the high point of yesterday. <laughs> um, and it's especially great here to be at Eagleton. Uh, Florence, Pichine, Eagleton, uh, one of the, uh, her great accomplishments was an involvement with League of Women Voters, and my mother was a great uh, a, a worker for the League of Women Voters. I don't know how many times I ate sandwiches and soup because my mother was out working for the League. Uh, so it's, uh, it's great to be here, and, and, and plus to be at Eagleton, it's a great school, and I wish I'd seen, heard these two presentations you had already, especially the first one, uh, how the whole place works. Um, basically, I've been asked to speak on three things. One is the gridlock in Washington. The second thing is uh, Dodd-Frank Wall Street reform, kind of what went on when I was down there as a senator, something I spent a lot of time on. And then uh, ethics in Congress. So let me start with gridlock. Um, there's really, uh, gridlock is, is, is really something new. It's been a real change in the parties. In the 90s, uh, we used to say, as a Democrat, as a partisan Democrat, and working for a Democrat, uh, we used to say the bad news is we're losing the South. And then we said the good news is we're losing the South. <laughs> uh, and the reason was, uh, back then, the Democratic Party was kind of split. Uh, uh, because you had the Southern Democrats and you had the Northern Democrats, and the Republican Party was kind of split because you had the Northern Republicans and the Southern Republicans. What's really happened, though, uh, and one of the things that's causing our gridlock and that we have to watch especially carefully is the change in the parties become ideological parties. The clicker. Which one do I push? Uh, this one here. Uh, okay. You can take a look at this. This is, let's start with 1982. In 1982, if you look up here in the House of Representatives, what this is, this, these are charts with the most liberal member of Congress on this end and the most conservative member of Congress on that side. Do you, see what, do you see what the charts are, each one of them? So basically what the National Journal did is National Journal, which is a publication in Washington uh, that kind of covers the Congress and keeps, keeps, keeps track of the facts. What they did is they have a rating system for every member of Congress. Everybody has a rating system. National Journal has a pretty good rating system. And they basically rate people from liberal to conservative. So if you go back to 1982 in the House of Representatives, you see that, that, that here is the most, the most conservative Democrats all the way over here at 10%, and the most liberal Republicans all the way over here at about 85% in terms of being liberal. You see what that means? So what you had back then, and then you go look at the Senate, uh, the, Senate uh, the Senate's pretty much the same story. It's not quite as dramatic. I mean, there aren't, they aren't all the way over, but the, but the Democrats are, and you know, we had conservative Democrats. I mean, if you go back and look at the Democrats back in 1982. Now, the, the answer to this was, in the Senate, you had senators like Jacob Javits, who was a senator from New York, who was as liberal, would you say, as liberal as anybody in the Senate? And you had um, the senator from New Jersey, Clifford Case, very liberal uh, senator. You had them, and then you had Democrats like uh, um, Herman Talmadge from Georgia and, and uh, in fact, James O'Eason, these were segregationist senators. They were Democrats who were segregation, who had who'd been for segregation, uh, who fought the, uh, the uh, civil rights law. Uh, so you, that's why you had this incredible split. Now, fast forward to what happened. The South started going uh, uh, Republican. So a lot of, for instance, the Georgia delegation turned over in just, I think, two or three elections to the vast majority of congresspersons from Georgia where Republicans went from Democrats and Republicans. Right now, there is not a Democratic senator in any of those states across the country. Mark Pryor lost in um, Arkansas and um, Louisiana. Yeah, um, Mary Landrieu lost in, in New Orleans. That was the last of that. So you've gone really from a solid South being Democratic to a solid South being Republican. So when you look at 2013, this is what you see. You have all the Democrats, with, with two exceptions, 
two or three exceptions, being more liberal than all the Republicans. Now, okay, so what does that mean? Uh, what that means is that when you look at what the party's positions are going to be, if you're in every, every um, Tuesday in the Senate, there's a meeting of the Democratic caucus for lunch and meeting of the Republican caucus for lunch. Caucus is Senate is congressional language for all the Democrats and, and get together and all the Republicans get together. Back if you went into one of those meetings in 1982, you would hear a lively debate in the Democratic caucus on all the issues, like just civil rights. You'd have these very liberal northern senators arguing with these very conservative southern senators about what we should be doing. I, be, I sat in the Democratic caucus for two years. We didn't have those kinds of arguments because by and large, most of the Democrats in that caucus agreed with each other on what we should be doing. And if I, I'm sure if I went to the Republican caucus, I would find that most of the people in the Republican caucus believed what they were together, what they were saying. So you don't have, when, when people talk about we got to be bipartisan, bipartisan starts with a Democratic senator and a Republican senator getting together and agreeing on something. Well, it was easy when they were kind of in the same caucus, right? I mean, it was easy they, where they knew people that were like them. Now, it's just more and more difficult on the big issues because the parties are so split on what they believe. Okay, this is districts split. Can you see this? Yeah, this is, this is, this is split districts. This is, this is districts, the difference between the, the, uh, the um, presidential vote in a district and the uh, vote for uh, uh, a member of Congress. So they're split. Well, if you go back to 1972, uh, where were we, 1972, there were 192 split districts. So people in the 192 districts were voting for one person for Congress and voting for somebody else for president. 192. At that time in 1972, it was 44% of all the districts in the United States were split districts. So you went into a district and you got the returns the next day. If you walked down the street and you met people, they were voting for a Democrat for president, Republican for the Congress, or they voting for a Republican for president, a Democrat for the Congress. Do you see what it is today? 5.7%. There are only 25 districts. They've gone, we've gone from 1972, 192 districts, to just 25 districts where they split the vote between the president and the, and the Congress. So, um, You can see that, 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 that this is a dramatic change in the way people are. People in districts are getting, not only the parties getting homogenous, but the districts are getting homogenous. So that if you're in a district, and I'll return to this again, um, and th to me it's incredible because uh, for most of my career when people were asked, uh, who are you going to vote for? I vote for the person. I'm not a party person, I vote for the person. And I think by and large that's what people say today. But now, the single best indicator, if you, if you want to ask a person one question to find out who they're going to vote for in an election, so an election for, 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 uh, in, uh, for uh, Congress today in New Jersey, uh, and, uh, for Senate today in New Jersey, and you want to predict how they were going to vote, you ask them one question, you know what the one question would be? What party do you belong to? That's a big change. And it isn't that they, it isn't that they, it isn't like they're, slavishly in line. They just vote for the people that agree with them. And these two, when you have two ideological parties, when you have two ideological parties, I'm going to be, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Democrat. Well, you know, most, I don't vote Democrats because I vote the party line. I vote Democrat because most of the Democrats agree with me. Does that make sense? You see, see, see the point I'm, uh, I'm making on this thing? Uh, the irony is that the very time this is happening, the parties are dying. Parties are practically gone. We can, uh, uh, they just, uh, parties don't have any power anymore. I mean, the last party, when they started, when they passed Citizens United and gave all this money to the super PACs, the only thing the parties had left was the fact that they could accumulate money and help with campaigns and things like that. But the parties in this country are just about dead. And now they even have rules, like in California, you don't even have to register as your party. You can come in if there's a primary, you can come in and, and vote in a primary if you want to. You can come in and declare what party you want to belong to. Um, so, at the same time, the party identification is coming, the most important uh, indicator, the parties are dying, and parties just don't have any power anymore. Uh, people are now voting ideology, not party, and then they know the party with which they agree. Now, um, 
take a look at this. This, this is what we call uh, shows landslide districts. Now, landslide districts in the dark blue and the dark red are districts where more than 10 to 20 percent of the people in that district belong to a party that's greater than the, than the party in the country. See what I'm saying here? So, in, so if you looked at back in 1992, there were 65 districts that were, they're going to vote Democratic. Trust me. They're going to vote for Democrat. And 58 districts, they were going to vote Republican. Those districts, you didn't have a chance to be elected if you were a Republican running in, in one of these districts or a Democrat running in one of those districts. So it's 65 and 58. Look what it is today. 117 Democratic districts and 125 Republican districts. So, you know, people can talk all they want to about everything they want to talk about, but in fact, these folks are not interested and don't care about general elections. If you, if you say there's a whole discussion, another discussion about uh, how much members of Congress or elected officials care about re-election, I think it's a very important consideration, but it's not what it's all about. Trust me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I mean, I just always ask my students a question. I say, do you think senators have big egos? What do you think as a group? Pretty big egos? Yeah, yeah, don't feel bad because of me. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, most people that, 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 you know, you don't get to be president of the university if you don't get to have, have an ego. You don't get to be governor if you don't have an ego. You don't get to be a cardinal in the Catholic Church unless you've got an ego. So it's not, I'm not knocking ego, but ego's it's ego. So what you have to believe if you believe all members care about re-election is you have to believe that someone goes through what you have to go through to be elected to the United States Senator today, raising the money, kissing babies, state fairs, the whole thing, and then when you get in the office, this big ego who's done through all this gets in the office, they sit down with their staff and they say, okay, show me the polling data because I want to vote on every one of these things based on what's going to help me get reelected. It just doesn't compute, right? The, my favorite example is uh, President Obama. One of the great things I got to do because uh, Joe Biden got elected vice president is I get to go to the transition meetings with, the, with uh, President-elect Obama right after the election in, in 2008. I mean, it's historic being a senator, but this was really even more of a high. So three days after the election, I went with Senator Biden, met with uh, Barack Obama in a room of about 10 people uh, who, and to decide what the Obama administration is going to be about. Who was going to be Secretary of State? Who was going to be Secretary of Treasury? What were the issues? So we come to the first meeting, and they say, well, we got it. obviously we got this financial crisis. We have to do something about the financial crisis. And we got to do something about this, you know, the foreign policy, and we got to get straight on what we're doing in Iraq and Afghanistan and the rest of that. And, uh, I, you know, really would be a good idea to, uh, to come up with some kind of a jobs program or something like that. And then the president said, and we're going to do something about health care. Well, these 10 people in the room, three of them had worked for Bill Clinton when Hillary tried to pass health care reform. A fellow named John Podesta is going to chair a campaign. Uh, um, Rahm Emanuel became governor of, of I mean, uh, uh, mayor of Chicago. They were in a room, and they're like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> healthcare, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, every president's tried to pass healthcare, and nobody's doing it, and if you take that on your first term, it's gonna be a disaster. You're never gonna get it passed, and it's just gonna, you're gonna use up your honeymoon. So, uh, we, we adjourned. Obama's incredible, by the way. No drama, Obama. He, no drama, Obama. You can sit there and he talks and I don't want any drama. Let's just get to what's going on. Number one. And number two is he makes decisions. We'd have a meeting and, I, you know, we talk about the first thing we talked about was who's going to be Secretary of Treasury. And there was Geithner and another person who was being considered for it. And we talked it all out. He said, okay, when we have the next meeting, I'll come back. I'll tell you who it's going to be. Come back the next meeting. He walked in and said, it's going to be Geithner. He, and, I mean, just that's just he's really, uh, you know, uh, uh, very good on that. So we come back to the second meeting. And we go through who we're going to, now we pick the Secretary of Treasury and Secretary of State, who's the next person we pick, uh, and uh, he, Attorney General and things like that. And, and we go through the list of issues, and we go through the same issues. We get to the end, and the President-elect says, and health care reform. And by this time, you know, people are, <laughs> oh, yeah, but they're still fighting. Don't want to do this. It's not good. <laughs> Come back for the third meeting, and I don't have to tell you what happened. He said, health care. So everybody said, okay, we're going to do health care. Well, you know why he did that? He did it because he said, after I hope to serve eight years, 
And if we don't do it in the first term, we're never going to do it in the second term. He understood about second terms. Second terms, why any president runs for a second term is a mystery to me. Second terms have been nightmares for, I mean, let's not talk about Richard Nixon and Lyndon Johnson and the rest of that and Clinton being impeached and all the bad things about George Bush having the financial crisis let's not, in Iraq. Let's not even talk about all that. Uh, it's just a disaster. So he knew his, he knew enough about history. He is a historian to say that we're not going to we're not going to be able to do this in the second we're not going to be able to do this in the second term. So we got to do it in the first term, right out of the box. But he said, you know what? He said, if I don't do this, he said, right now there are 35 million Americans without health care, and I will leave office. There'll be over 50 million Americans without health care. Okay, I don't care what you think about Obama. What has he been pilloried by by Democrats? One of the things the Democrats have said, you know, health care was great. But you know, you could have done so much more if you hadn't taken on health care. Health care is just a political disaster. So he didn't do it because he was wanting to get reelected. He did it because he really said, if I'm going to be president of the United States, that's what I'm going to do. And that's my experience. And Congressman Florio can tell you about his experience. But my experience was that's the way most of these, these people are. So they care about uh, they care about re-election, but it's much more important that, that they get something done while they're there. So anyway, 1992, there were 103 swing districts. In 2012, there's only 35. So what happens then is, if you're in a district where you know a Republicans or a Democrats going to get elected, and you're an incumbent and you're worried about re-election, are you worried about the general election? Huh? Are you listening? To, you care about the general in terms of re-election? Do you care about the general election? I don't know last time an incumbent Democrat or Republican got beat in a general election, one of these things. What do you get concerned about? The primary. If you don't learn anything else about what I'm saying this morning, it's about the primary. And let me tell you how the numbers work in a primary. Let's just say, I'm going to make it simple, let's just say you have a congressional district, there's supposed to be like 800,000, let's just say for the sake of argument, you have a, a, a hundred a, 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 a hundred thousand. So you start out in the district and it's a heavy Republican district, so you've got uh, maybe 50, because uh, no, the independents don't count, you've got maybe 40% of the people in the district who, are, who vote Republican, and you've got maybe 20% independents, and then the rest are Democrats. So 30 or 40%, maybe as high as 45%. Okay, so you've got 45% of the Republicans. What's the turnout in a primary? Let's just say, let's say 50%. It's 20, right? 20%? 25%? So you've got, you got a district with 100,000 people in it, there are 50,000 Republicans. 10,000 Republicans show up to vote. That means all you need to do in, in this district is 5,000 votes plus one. Do you see? See what that means? That means that the people who are going to come, if you care about re-election, you know, your issues move quickly from kind of the broad, all these issues, to very specific issues to people that come out and vote, and we know that people that come out and vote are usually more ideologically on the, on the extremes than the others, so that's what you're faced with. So that's, what we're, that's, what, that's one of the reasons why we have uh, the, um, the um, uh, things the way, the way they do and why we have gridlock, because there's a number of members, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna sound like I'm beating all the Republicans, but I'm not. They're going through a phase right now. I was with the Democrats, we went through it. The congressman went through it where the Democrats were. If, if you weren't a liberal, you weren't enough, and nothing was good enough, and the rest of that. But right now, you've got a bunch of Republican districts here where they don't really care about the big, broad issues. Like, for instance, immigration reform. Everybody says, well, they're gonna do some immigration reform. No, 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 no. Immigration reform in their district, they don't, first off, an incredible percentage of these 125 here and the 66 of the next group, they don't have 2 3% Hispanics in their district. And the people that aren't in the district, are, if you ask them the polls, what they're interested in, the Republican polls in that district, they're interested in, we got to do something about immigration. we got to build a big fence around the wall or, or, or things like that. So you've got a, you've got a, a section in the, in the caucus, in the, in the Republican caucus in the House, that just aren't in, in terms of re-election. Now, I, I said before, it isn't all about re-election. To the extent it is about re-election, they're sitting there saying, I don't want to do immigration reform. So you, you, trust me, there ain't going to be immigration reform due to Congress in the United States, even though the National Republican Party is calling for it, even though the National Chamber of Commerce is calling for it, everybody in the world is cheering for it. They're never going to get that thing. They're never going to get that through this present House of Representatives. Now, there's a thing called gerrymandering. Are you familiar with gerrymandering? You know, where you, you, you go in, and the Republicans have done an incredible job on that. They've just beat our beat the Democrats uh, to a pulp. They've got a lot more governors, they've got a lot more representatives, 
and, and, the, and the government, so they have gerrymandered. And people want to say that's the answer. So you read the pundits, they say, or cable television, the answer is the reason for all this is because of gerrymandering. Well, gerrymanders a factor, but the, it's the same thing's going on in the Senate, almost the same thing, and you can't gerrymander the Senate. Senators run statewide, so you, the gerrymandering's not. Uh, now, let me just tell you a, 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 a little story um, to kind of reinforce what I think is one of the most important things to kind of communicate, and that is that it, every, it's not all about politics, folks. It's not, I mean, every time you read a story out of Washington, it's about politics. John Boehner never did a thing in his world. You, you find me a story where John Boehner or Harry Reid ever did anything except for politics, or your member of Congress didn't do something because of politics. It's all politics. Come, every issue that comes up, it's about politics. It's just, that's not the way it is. Politics is an important thing, but it's, it, it, it's about, people care about what these issues are. So let me give you an example. I teach this course at the Duke Law School. And every year what I do is I take the students, uh, we go to Washington, uh, uh, we go to the Capitol, and we spend a day, and members of Congress, House members, Senate members, Republicans and Democrats, staff members, media people, they all come by and, uh, and talk to, that, to the students about what they think about the Congress and students asking questions. So I guess about three years ago, um, I invited John Barrasso. Does anybody here know who John Barrasso is? John Barrasso is the, Cong uh, the senator from Wyoming. I don't agree with John Barrasso on anything, okay? I like John Barrasso a lot, just to get through the part about, you know, we all hate each other. I really do. I mean, he's from Reading, Pennsylvania. He's an orthopedic surgeon. He's smart as hell. He cares about the country. He cares about Wyoming, where he's from. He, 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 he's a caring guy, and a guy, I just don't agree with him what to do. So John's talking to the class, and the class, the first question they asked, said, what are we going to do about the financial crisis? It was more than three or four years. Yeah, it was about three or four years. And he says the standard, what you'd expect, really say, what we've got to do is we've got to grow the economy, we've got to cut taxes, and he went through a list of, you know, kind of what we should do. Uh, and then um, John Kerry, who was then chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, they'd set up for him to come over. It was right after I left the Senate to give me something, a picture, and which was a nice staff thing to do, and I appreciate it. But you can't, if a senator comes in the room, you can't ask him to leave without talking, okay? <laughs> so John Kerry comes up there, and I said, John, why don't you talk about what you, because it, Barrasso had just spoken, why don't you think about talking about what we ought to be doing about the economy? And John said, oh, I'll tell you what we ought to do about the economy. What we ought to do in the economy is we got to worry about the people that got hurt. we got to create jobs. we got to take care of the people who are in disadvantage who are going to get hurt and throw out jobs. And we went on. So we went on the rest of the class. And the next, next um, meeting, we always do a, a kind of a download. What actually, what do you think, and what do you think about it? And um, you know what the students believed? They believed that John Barrasso was saying what he genuinely believed, number one. They thought that the people of Wyoming probably agreed with what John Barrasso, uh, uh, what, what John Barrasso was saying. And they believed John Kerry was saying what he believed. And they believed the people of Massachusetts agreed with what John Kerry was saying. There was no politics in this thing. This is, this is, these are people that really care. When you talk about these issues and what we ought to do about a financial recovery, you're going right to the heart of why people run for office. So there's a real difference of opinion in the parties. It isn't, it isn't about politics. And, and, it's, and so the, the, the thing that scares is uh, uh, whether this uh, uh, is this, this is a real change. Could this really, really, really be bad? The second reason for gridlock, in my opinion, is we, we used to have broadcasting. Now we have narrow casting. So the people are, <laughs> they, get, they get reinforced on whatever their positions are. It used to be, you know, you listen to the, the, the evening news. Now people listen to uh, cable. I might ask my students about where they get their most news from, and, and a lot of them say The Daily Show. Let me tell you something. I think The Daily Show and John Oliver are the best investigative journalists in this country. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I'll admit, I, got, I mean, I get a lot of what I get from those guys. And then you have this incredible power for the freshmen, because <clears throat> what happens is when you're in a district and you're worried about this and you're in one of these and you're worried about the primary, if Ted Cruz gets up and says, let's all march over to Cliff, He's a freshman. I mean, when Joe Biden was at the Senate, I don't think he gave a speech on the floor for two or three years. He was in a, in a committee for like a, a major planning committee. I mean, people, they used to say freshman center should neither be seen nor heard. <laughs> and until you learn what was going on. Well, so Ted Cruz comes in and he announces whatever he's going to do. They're not worried about Ted Cruz. He's a freshman center from Texas. 
What they're worried about is what Rush, Lim Rush Limbaugh is going to say and what Hannity is going to say that night on Fox News. So, and, or, and for Democrats, it's what, you know, what MSNBC is not as strong. Fox obviously has a much larger uh, following. But this whole thing, this incredible thing that happened with Tom Cotton, Brandon, he's been a senator for 35 days. He convinces 47 senators to do something that's never been done in the Senate before, and that is send a letter to a foreign head of state, number one, hasn't been done before, and number two, saying our president's wrong, and three, don't even listen to him. How do you get 47 senators to sign on to that? It wasn't because of his power or anything else. It was because they knew that was going to be the top of the news that night. I thought John McCain, who is a great guy and a great senator, in my opinion. John McCain, he immediately said, this is just terrible. And then, then he saw the people were really upset about this. He said, well, you know, it was the end of a session, and we had a snowstorm, and we were trying to get out of town. <laughs> and that's, that probably is why he did. Somebody came to him and said, you know, we got 27 senators signing on for this senator. A staff person came in and said, hey, senator, we're going to sign on to this. Um, so th this, this is kind of scary because this is, this is what the, 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 a lot of the change is going on. My personal concern about what's going on in Washington today is real. Is, it goes into something, uh, just uh, what, I, what I think is the key of our problems. And that is every business school, every public policy school, every university practically has a school or at least a program on leadership, right? Have any of you ever, ever taken a leadership program? I mean, everybody's taking leadership programs, right? It's all about leadership. It's all about me being a leader, right? You know what there are no courses on? Huh? Go ahead. Oh, I said being a follower. Being a follower. No, no, I'm, I'm deadly, I, am de I am deadly serious. There's nobody who wants to be a follower. I feel so bad for John Boehner. I mean, you know, the people talk about uh, uh, Reagan and Tip O'Neill. I love it when they talk about Reagan and Tip. Oh, you know, Tip used to go down. He used to play with Reagan, and then he'd come back, and they'd work out these deals, and why can't they do that now and the rest of it? Let me tell you why they can't do this now. That had nothing to do with parties and Obama not inviting them down and all the rest of that. He invited them down, and then he found out it ain't going to do any good because uh, what, uh, the way it is now is when, when O'Neill met with Reagan and they made a decision on something and they shook hands on it, he knew Tip O'Neill went back to that caucus, and I guarantee you, that Democratic caucus in the House, they voted for what Tip O'Neill promised Reagan he was going to do. Trust me. They did. John Boehner, uh, in, 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 right out of the box during the, the, uh, the cliff, remember the cliff, the, the, we're going to go over the cliff and we're going to close down government? John Boehner made a deal with the president, and then he had to come back and say to the president, I can't, I, I can't get the votes. They tried to get the votes in the Congress. Look at how many times Boehner's had totally done something that, I mean, your days in the House, never, the leader of the House, speaker, gets up and proposes a, a, a bill and then can't get enough people of his own party to vote for it. This isn't like something that happened back in a caucus. This is something that happens right out on the floor. What, this last thing, I can't even remember what it is now, there's so many of them, the cromnibus. I mean, it was humiliating for Boehner. I mean, they didn't make a deal they could have made because the, public, the, the, the caucus said, uh, we're not going to do that, we're not going to do that, we need something about health care, we got to get rid of Obamacare. So what did they end up settling for? Nothing. They got nothing. Remember? The vote came up and we were down the last, 20, last hours and somebody said, hey guys, you know, we're going to close down Homeland Security. That You do not want to close down Homeland Security. Um, now, I, there is one, in my opinion, one cause for wh why not to, you know, jump under the bus. I could throw it on the bus, but jump on the bus. And that is, you know, it wasn't that many years ago. I mean, they talk about gridlock. Hey, when I was down there, not because I was down there, in 2009, 2010, we passed more legislation than any Congress, according to two, two, the two guys who were kind of recognized in Washington as the best, Tom Mann and Nora Mornstein. One works for AEI, the other works for Brookings. Passed more legislation in 2009, 2010 than any Congress since uh, Johnson, for sure, and maybe even FDR. Because remember what we passed. We passed the... the um, uh, Obamacare, we passed a stimulus bill, $800 billion stimulus bill, we passed uh, credit card reform, we passed um, Dodd-Frank, the Wall Street reform, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, so there's a lot of so that's, you know, this is not something that's been around for 20 years and we don't know what to do about it. Uh, second reason is, is um, I believe that a lot of the anger and the reason why the extremes and, uh, uh, have had uh, more swack is because of the Great Recession. You know, to a lot of people, 
The Great Recession ended in 2009. According to The Economist, it ended in 2009. But for real people, it was a horror. And it's still a horror. And they still don't have their house. And they, 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 the graduates from college are still not getting the jobs they should be getting. This thing is going on. It's not so bad for most of the people that, that, that are uh, in the upper economic brackets. I'm not talking about the 1 percent. I'm talking about the top 40 percent or 50 percent. They came through this, and it's hard to explain to them that the recession is still going on. But those folks down below, they're mad as hell. I had Democrats come up to me and say, why doesn't the president tell them in, in the last election about how the economy's come back? I said, you want to get stoned? You go into a district uh, of, of, of lower middle class people and poor people and working poor, and you get up and talk about how great the economy's going, they're going to throw things at you. And they're going to have an absolute, total, complete right to throw things at you. So my basic feeling is that, you know, if you want to know what's going on, look at the question they ask. Do you think the country's going in the right direction or the wrong track? And that usually gets pretty indication. Well, the wrong track, I think, now is up to maybe 35 percent. That is a horrible number. <laughs> there are a lot of Americans. I mean, the right track is up to 35 percent in the right direction. Most Americans think we're not in the right direction yet. But as the economy as the economy's gotten better for more people, you watch that number goes up. And when that number's up, then people are more thoughtful about the community and not so much focused on their own concerns, which they have a perfect right to be focused on. Now, let me talk a little bit about Dodd-Frank. Um, and what happened? <coughs> Basically, what happened in Dodd Frank? <coughs> we were going to we had this terrible thing in the in the, in the economy, so we had to uh, uh, we had to do something to fix up what happened on Wall Street. Um, and the administration, the Republicans, basically agreed on what to do, and that was they were concerned about the fragility of the banks. Okay, they said no, we can't do too much to the banks because they're fragile. I didn't agree with them, uh, but that's really kind of so. And all the votes. It was, we don't want to, buy, uh, to, to hurt the banks. Second thing they decided was, what, what had worked for us, in my opinion, uh, was after the Great Depression, they had a thing called the Pecora Commission. And what they did is they sat down and they put together a, um, uh, a bunch of hearings. And they came out and they put in force a law called the Glass-Steagall Act. Does anybody know the Glass-Steagall Act? Well, the Glass-Steagall Act, what it did was, we always had these bank panics. <coughs> where people would hear a bank's going to fail and they run to the bank, they had to get their money out first. So what they did about that, they invented a thing called FDIC insurance, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And basically what they said is, don't worry, you don't have to rush to the bank. It started out, I don't know, $1,000 or something out now. I think it's $250,000. As long as this bank's FDIC insured, you're not going to have to worry about it because the federal government's going to come in and pay you unless you get over $250,000. And even then, they're probably going to come in and pay you. So you don't have to worry about it. But, 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 but. If you're going to do that, if you want to be a bank that does that, gets FDIC insurance, you can't really invest in anything risky because you shouldn't be able to risk the taxpayer's money. <clears throat> does that make sense? Does that comport with what everybody thinks about glass deal was? Well, then, in the 1990s, a Democratic administration uh, and Republicans uh, decided that, um, and a lot of Democrats, too, in the, in the Congress, decided we got to do away with that. Uh, that's holding us back. We can't compete with international banks. We need universal banks. This is what we have to do. So they, in 1999, they repealed Glass-Steagall. Now, in my opinion, one of the biggest reasons why we went down is because we had all these big commercial banks that were too big to fail. First, they were too big because they were doing investment banking and commercial banking, and they failed because they had all these risky derivatives and other kinds of crazy things that they were investing in that they never could have invested in if they were still a commercial bank. There used to be commercial banks and investment banks. And that's really why we had to, to bail those folks out. So we should, what we ought to do is we ought to go back and learn from history. You know, those don't study history are, are doomed to repeat it, OK? There's a lot of that going on. Uh, and we, we got to go back to that. And we got to get uh, uh, do something about that. Um, and so we had to do it. Well, they nah, we're not going to do that. Nope, uh, the banks are too fragile. We can't break up the banks. Now, remember, too, the banks had gotten even bigger. And then. Um, what they didn't do, the other thing they did, like Glass-Steagall, and Glass-Steagall, they made bright line law. They wrote a law, I think it's only 35 pages or something. They basically said, this is what the law is going to be. No, 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 we're not going to do that. We're going to shoot it all back to the regulatory agencies to decide. So they came up with, what was it, uh, 390 rules that they sent to the regulatory agencies that were supposed to fix this thing. But now, the irony of this is that one of the big causes of the whole meltdown was because we didn't do regulation for a number of years. We had what we call lazy fay economics. If you ever, if you want to hear, it's about Lawrence Kudlow is on CNBC every night talking about how we shouldn't have any regulatory agencies and they just get in the way and you know all those kinds of things. We had a head of the SEC called Chris Cox who's, 
who after this whole thing was over, he says, you know, I, I, I always thought that, that the free market would take care of this, but now I know it won't. Even Alan Greenspan came out and said that who was for big for no regulation. Um, so he, here we had no regulation, one of the causes, so they're going to make it harder for regulation. And what we're going to do is we're going to put 390 new rules on these regulators, and then we're not going to give them any more money to deal with all this in addition to everything else they're doing. It's going out there. So what happened is, uh, as you stand today, five years after the bill passed, only 235 of the 390 rules that were propounded have actually become rules. And let me tell you, there's 235, some of them are horrible, just absolutely horrible. And what this did, this allowed the lobby, what the bank lobby, which sometimes in Washington they call it the blob, to really operate where they know how to operate. Lots of money. So you have a case, there's a thing called the Volcker Amendment. If you get an overload on this. <laughs> anyway, the Volcker Amendment was really was trying to have a poor person's Glass-Steagall was supposed to say that, that if you were a commercial bank, you couldn't invest in proprietary trading and these risky trading. So we got it passed. It was weak and the rest of it. Lobbying on, the, on this, five, we gave it to five agencies to settle. They still haven't finished. This was the heart and soul of what we were doing here. And it, it still hasn't been done. And they, uh, a, a woman who teaches at the Duke Law School named Kim Kroyak, who's one of my colleagues down here, did a study. She did a study of the five regulatory agencies, all the contacts that were made to the commissioners on those regulatory agencies. 92% of the people that contacted a commissioner or staff at a regulatory agency involved in the Volcker Amendment, lobbying the Volcker Amendment, were either a Wall Street bank, a lawyer for a Wall Street bank, an accountant for a Wall Street bank, or a financial trade organizations. 8% was consumer groups and labor. So that's the reason we haven't got a Volcker Amendment. I mean, it's, it's very easy to stop things. It's, it's, it's sometimes hard to, to, to get them passed. And where are we five years later? Banks are still too big to fail. They were too big. We know in 2008 they were too big to fail, right? And then what do we do during the, during the uh, which we had to do? We took Merrill Lynch and Countrywide and put it into Bank of America. We took Bear Stearns and Washington Mutual and put it into J.P. Morgan Chase. We put Wachovia and put it into Wells Fargo. So we know they were too big in 2008. They are much, much bigger now. Um, and we found out the things that we had put in, like resolution authority and and uh, living wills. They just threw out the Fed. Just the, the Fed threw out all the living wills that the bankers had presented. This is five years afterwards. They still don't have a living will. So they. <clears throat> so it, we know banks are still big to fail. We know that FDIC uh, banks are involved in risky investments. The con the House just passed a bill on the Cromnibus, the current resolution omnibus bill at the end of the session that said, in Dodd-Frank, one good thing they had was they said that if you were going to invest in, the, in these risky investments, you had to get them into a non-FDIC-insured subsidiary. See what they were trying to do? They were trying to say, if these banks failed, then the bank would be on the banks, it wouldn't be on us. They put it back. So now they went to all the derivatives and said, passed a bill as part of the Congress. Basically said, OK, guys, we're going to have the American taxpayer insure all this stuff. Um, so anyway, this, some of this involves some ethical challenges, and I'll finish on that. Uh, first is campaign finance. Uh, when I was in, this, in the last years in the Senate uh, as a staffer, uh, they had a thing called a Congressional Management Foundation, and the head of the foundation said, look, we're having all the House administrative chiefs of staff get together, and we're going to, and we're going to give them a speech on different things. Will you come over and talk about the ethics of campaign finance reform? I said, well, <laughs> I can do it, but it's going to be a very short speech. There's nothing ethical about the campaign finance law. Because ethics say that when you're elected to an office by people, that you should be holding to them, and there should be no other reason why you should be beholding to people. And as soon as you put money into the mix, it doesn't mean the people are crooked. It means you put money in the mix. That is a conflict of interest, and that is potentially be an ethical violation. No one knows for sure unless somebody writes it down on a thing and says, I'm giving you $10,000 dollars we vote for my thing. They don't know uh, whether, it's, uh, whether it's actually a legal violation, but it's clearly an ethical violation. And that's the whole system is built on that. Now, it's not, it, it, uh, the vast, 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 vast majority of members of Congress aren't even the least bit corrupt. And the reason you can find us, very few of them ever get tried for anything, and they make public disclosures that tell everything they're going to do. Here's the way it works, though. Okay. My wife, Lynn, decides that she's going to run for the House of Representatives, and I decided I'm going to run for the House of Representatives. 
And Lynn is concerned about the capital gains taxes, not doing to make sure we do away with the state tax. We keep this is all true. <laughs> we we, <laughs> we keep uh, we keep uh, tax rates hot top tax rates low. She's running, and I'm running against her. And I think we ought to do something about the poor and disadvantaged. And I think we ought to do something about housing. And I think we ought to be doing something about eliminating the capital gains. Okay. And we're now, still married. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you think is going to get the money? Who's going to get the money? Right? There's no nothing corrupt going on. There's no quid pro quos. There is no quid pro quos. So what you end up is a lot of folks in the Congress who basically, going back to my Barrasso Kerry thing, really believe it. They really believe it. I'm telling you, you talk to John Barrasso, he may turn you around. Or you talk to Kerry, he may turn you around. Because they really could and they really believe it and they're smart as, they're smart as hell. So uh, uh, there aren't quid pro quos. The idea that the Supreme Court, I mean, this is the United thing. I don't even want to get started. But the idea that the only corruption that goes on is quid pro quo corruption. People don't hand bags across tables with money in them anymore, guys. Trust me. But you have corruption. As Norm Morenstein, the guy I quoted earlier from the American Enterprise Center, says about uh, when he mentioned that uh, um, Justice Kennedy said, uh, well, what this is do, there is no real signs of corruption. Norm Orange, he said, what planet is he on? Because I think tests used to be for campaign financing, is, are we dealing with corruption, the perception of corruption? And Kennedy wrote, there is no corruption in this thing. Well, if you think that what's going on now with the super PACs and Marvin Adelson putting $100 million in this race and Koch brothers announcing they've got $890 million, and now I saw in today's paper that Tom Steyer, the, the, the environmental guy, who's a Democrat, is going to raise, says he can raise a trillion dollars. That ain't corruption. I don't know what the hell corruption is. And there's no quid pro quos going on there, trust me. Or there's not, not any quid pro quos. I know that. Second thing that most makes this thing most dangerous is the revolving door with ethics. Uh, I think it's really important. I mean, one of the things I think that, that to the extent I was successful as, as working in the Senate, being a senator, a lot of it had to do was I spent uh, a good 15 years in the private sector. So I think you can learn a lot from the private sector. If you're in government, I think you can learn a lot about uh, 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 in the private sector. You learn about government. If you want to go, you want to come out of government, and want to go into the private sector. I think that you're better in the private sector if you understand government. So I really think that's that's really important. But what's happened now? When I was in the, in the in, and this is like old guy talking about you know when I was young, it was all great. And, you know, I, I'm only reminding of uh, there's a, there was a musical uh, Bye Bye Birdie. In the 1950s, it's been brought back a couple of times, but one of the songs was, why can't they be like we were, perfect in every way? What's the matter with kids today? So, I mean, every time I hear some old guy talking about, you know, trust me, this has been going on ever since I've been old guys and old women. Nice guys for men and women. Um, but uh, uh, people go in the Senate and they make a career out of the Senate. I mean, I worked in the Senate for 22 years. <clears throat> I wasn't doing it, you know, I didn't go into lobbying afterwards or anything like that. But now what's happened is people go into government, and the, a friend of mine was in the Justice Department, there a young per he was an assistant attorney general, and a young person that was in, in his department came up to him and said, hey, what do you, uh, uh, you know, I'd like to talk to you about my career. And he said, fine. Uh, he said, I want, to I want to talk to you about monetizing my government service. Monetizing my government service. What, what are the things I can do so when I get out, I can make a lot of money? Now, Jacob Liu, who's an honorable guy, really smart. He was uh, head of OMB. He's uh, uh, chief of staff to the president. He's the head of the Treasury Department now. When he left Citigroup, <clears throat> the bank, Citigroup, Citibank, you know, the big one in New York. I don't, I don't think, I think J.P. Morgan Chase passed, but it used to be the biggest bank in the world, or in the United States. <clears throat> they had a clause in his contract that said, if he left, he lost his benefits unless he took a job in a high regulatory or administrative position in the U.S. government. Now, you, you Google Jacob Liu, and you Google this, and you'll find that that is exactly what is, 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 was in his contract. Now, does that mean he was doing anything wrong? I don't know if he's doing anything wrong or not. Sure as hell is a conflict of interest, though, isn't it? Now, my cl the worst case, in my opinion, is I won't even tell the woman's name. There was a, there was a woman 
who was a commissioner of the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, when they were considering whether to give Comcast uh, NBC, I think it was NBC, NBC, uh, and uh, she, was on, she, was, she was in there. There are five of them. They're going to vote on whether they do this or not. So she voted for, for, the, the, uh, for the merger, and the merger went through, which was an abomination in my opinion. Why do we need a bigger media company with more power? I mean, that's not going to help us in international trade. What's the reason for this? So she voted for it. Six months later, she went to work for Comcast. Now, I don't know what was going on in her mind back then, but do you think she thought if she voted no, she was going to go to work for Comcast? <laughs> it was not, you know, it was, it was never going to happen. And the thing that's most dangerous about this, people say, well, you know, the votes and the rest of it. What was really key to this is she's sitting there when we're doing the negotiations. It's like being on a jury. You're on a jury with 12 people, and you've decided that you've been bought by the defendant. It isn't just that you vote one of 12. You're sitting, if you ever watched, uh, what was the thing with uh, 12 angry men, you know, if, 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 if she was sitting in that meeting, there were only five of them. And she was committed to this not going forward because she was concerned. She may have been committed to it without, you know, wanting to go to work for Comcast, but clearly on board. That is going to have incredible impact on what's going to happen on this thing. And when you look now, I mean, the Justice Department is like Securities Exchange Commission. People, Mary Jo White. Mary Jo White was a, a, an incredible prosecutor, great prosecutor. And she came back into the, uh, she, went, she went to work for, for a firm that spends all their time defending people against SEC actions. And she was very active in that firm. At the time she's doing it, she's a wonderful lady. I'm not saying anything bad about it. I'm just saying she did some, it's like kids, you know, they're not bad, they just do some bad things. But she did, her, she did her job, and her job was to go back to the Justice Department and get deals for her clients. Now, who was she dealing with? She was dealing with young people she met at her when she was the head of the uh, U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of New York. Now she's back in the Security Exchange Commission again. You know where her husband is? He's just Gravath and Swain, one of the major, major uh, defense attorneys uh, uh, litigation. She was at Du Bois Plimpton. He's with, and two of her, her number one assistants over at Du Bois Plimpton where she was. And Rob Kazami, who was the head of the Enforcement Division, when he left, dedicated public servant, great, been public servant for a while, they had, they had the lottery for, for Kazami. And he ended up making $5 million first year out of, out of being the enforcement division of the SEC. Now, during that time, the SEC didn't, the, the Justice Department did not bring a sing, single criminal case against any of the people involved in the banking scandal. A thousand people went to jail during the savings loan, and during this thing, we didn't convict a single person. Now, I'm not saying that I am not saying these are bad people and they did bad things. I'm just saying you have an incredible, incredible, incredible conflict of interest and surely they can find somebody at the Serious Change Commission to work for a consumer group. I mean, there are loads of people around who, who and, and, and some, and trial attorneys on the other side, people that came in and tried these things. Surely they can find them. And the final thing is um, economies and think tanks. Economies and think tanks. So you read, you know, I remember <clears throat> a number of years ago when my, when my kids were a lot younger, I read a study in USA Today and it said that there was a study done that sugar really doesn't cause attention to add attention deficit disorder. Yeah, so then I found out it was, it was sponsored by the American Sugar Institute and there were 26 kids in the study. <laughs> so what, <clears throat> what happens in the, the academic side, you, you read these reports and you just want to scream because you know where it came from. And again, it doesn't have to be anything crooked. I go, I'm working for a major bank. I say to the bank, let's endow a chair at, you know, at Rutgers. To look into this stuff, okay? And here's, here's what I'm looking for. Who do you think, he's, who do you think they're looking for? So they're, they're, they, you gotta be good to be, become a professor, but then you become a professor, and that's, that's how you got picked. Not the only thing, and not all professors, the vast, vast again, it's like members of Congress, the vast, 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 vast members of academics know. But there's a number of very disturbing things, and what's disturbing about it is not that they do it, it's that there's no disclosure. They don't disclose the fact that they're being funded by, you know, this group or that group. I mean, this isn't just about banking. This is about everything. If you're going to write about something, you're going to put out a, a learned paper, you ought to in somewhere. And, and, and again, this is like 99% of, of, the, of, of major uh, peer-reviewed articles. They do this. But unfortunately, we've got a bunch of folks that say the same with climate change. We get some people that just made a bundle out of climate change and are funded by the oil companies and people like that, and not all, not everybody. So I think the the, the ethical viol the ethical challenges to members of Congress, to members of the administration, 
and to people in and academic and think tanks are key. I want to finish with this. <coughs> this lecture is named for former Mayor Arthur Holland. Um, and I think he summed up pretty well um, when he talked about what he wanted to do with this thing. He said, Politi political virtue is not only its own reward, that being peace of conscience and freedom from fear of exposure is the means to freedom of administrative action. I could not agree more. Thanks a lot. We can do questions and answers. Trust me, Americans are going to figure it out. Americans are going to figure it out. It's going to take a while. It's, and, and what I say, just like I say, we're going to replace Glass Steagall. Trust me, we're going to do it. It's just how much damage are you going to do before we do it? <laughs> so, my answer to you is we'll do it, but how much damage are you going to have before we do it? How much damage? Because right now, the amount of money that is spent preserving what it is that, 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 that Place for the citizens of the United States, the amount of money being spent is humongous. And one of the problems we have is <clears throat> when Jim Fourier got started in Congress and I was working as a staff in the Senate in Washington, and trust me, I'm not saying true. Whenever we had a big issue, in the door would come the Chamber of Commerce, in the other door would come the labor unions, right? So every big issue, like Dodd Frank, if Dodd Frank was being considered in the 1970s, you'd be, Chamber be here, the banks be here. The labor unions be over there. Labor unions have people coming in. They know what they're doing. They'd be running ads back in home this and all that stuff. Uh, John Kenneth Goldberg wrote a book called Countervailing Pressures. He talked about countervailing pressures. He said one of the things that makes the Washington work is countervailing pressures. So we used to have, and a lot of people, oh, unions this, unions that. Uh, but unions are the ones, if you want to know why the biggest reason we have income inequality on the bottom side, it's those unions. You look at the fall of the trade union movement in the United States in the private sector, and you look at the end of defined benefit pension programs, you look at the, uh, uh, the lack of increase in pay, it's all went down the, the tubes with the unions. Now, there's some public sector unions, but the private sector unions be the major factor in this country for us being in there. So there is, if there is anybody anymore to make, kind of make the argument. So, so you're, you're optimistic. I just want to ask, yes, yeah. please use the microphone just so that we can capture it. Your, your, your oh, yeah, optimistic. Sorry. your optimistic point was that Americans will figure out right. in due course that their system is corrupt. What will lead them to do that? What, what, what events, what, what, what emerging information, what, what passions will lead to that uh, optimistic conclusion? Free press. We have a free press. I think the press, I think the press will keep on reporting this and keep on reporting this. And I think, uh, you know, it, it, again, I don't, there's no way with this present Congress and uh, the present system in place that you're going to get this, this Citizens United reverse. The idea of a constitutional amendment is just there ain't going to be no constitutional amendment, folks. Trust me. You need, you know, you, you know I'm going to get close. We haven't had a constitutional amendment in a long, long time. We're not going to have it on this. So it's just going to take, uh, take time and it's going to take damage. And, and uh, the, you know, the thing that most explains Washington to me and explains a lot of things to me in Washington is the pendulum. Yeah, we keep doing this, we do bad things, we keep doing bad things, we do bad things, and then bang. Now the problem is, many times, like we had no regulation, we have no regulation, we have no regulation, we get up here, then it comes back. It doesn't stop here, proper regulation, then we start over-regulating. So the pendulum's gonna swing back. That's the way, that's the way our system works. Uh, so anyway, I, I think um, it ain't gonna happen, it's not gonna happen anytime soon. 2016 could be the time when, I mean, it's just getting so obscene. Uh, you know, uh, presidential candidates being called in by an individual who can give $100 million to their campaign and being, you know, they have to tell him how much they love him and care for him and all the things they're going to do for him. 
I don't know what another definition of obscenity is. That's a pretty good definition of me what obscenity is. I know when I see it, is it what Justin Powell said? So if you have a question, please raise your hand. I'll bring you the microphone. And just remember that we're filming, so please state your name and your Rutgers affiliation. So. Good afternoon, Senator. Um, my name is Parag Shande. I'm a senior here at Rutgers. So you talked about uh, Wall Street. In recent uh, days, the Wall Street bankers have threatened the Democrats to withhold donations uh, out of retaliation for the ways that uh, Senators Warren and Brown have been talking about them. If you were to advise the Democrats, which way would you recommend they go uh, to continue with the way Elizabeth Warren has gone, which is continuing to attack them and demonize them, or the way um, Democrats like Chuck Schumer or the Clintons have gone, which is to you know, uh, have close relationships with them. Well, I don't. I, I think it's. I think Clinton and and uh, who else did you mention? Chuck Schumer. Yeah, I don't think they have. I mean, I, I wouldn't say close relations. Schumer voted for a lot of this legislation. He does represent New York, and uh, Hillary's taking some money from Goldman Sachs. But I think that we'll see where her campaign goes. I think that's what's going to go. And in terms of Elizabeth Warren, and she just, as far as I'm concerned, it's what Harry Truman says. You know, they say I'm just telling them the truth, and they, they, I'm not giving them hell. I'm telling them the truth, and it's hell. And that's, you know, she just, I, I, I challenge anybody. You look at Elizabeth Warren facts. Just go and look. Take any one of her speeches. I'll, I'll take it, any one. And go and see something she said that wasn't true. I mean, this, this, de this, this denigration of her as a populist, which is the populist term, it's just incredible. So I, in terms of this, this, this is like a gift to the Democrats. They weren't giving the Democrats money anyway, trust me. Obama got no, practically no Wall Street money when he ran in 2012. He did okay. So this is not, you know, this, the money isn't everything, if I understand this thing. But he, just like when they did the thing on the Cromnibus bill, you know, with the part where they gave them, the, they, they, allowed, they had said they could put the, the derivatives into, had, they could put derivatives into FDIC uh, subsidiaries. It, it, it hurt them. They're not getting anything passed now. And I think that this thing, I mean, the Democrats love it. I mean, the Democrats are going to make money on that one, trust me. They're going to put it on, in the system and it's going to go out there and, you know, Wall Street, is you know, it says they're not going to give me money. That means you have to give me money. So I think that's fine. I, I think I think this is going to be the, po positions are determined pretty much by presidential campaigns. In my you know big big question big issue things, and um, I think this campaign um, it's going to be interesting to see what see for instance it's going to be interesting what happens on the Democratic side with Citizens United. I mean, if the President of the United States runs on doing something about Citizens United. Uh, we'll see, but I, I think it's, it's still to be seen um, where they're, uh, uh, how, how it's going to go. But you, you put your finger on it. Just I mean, in the Democratic Party, the main thing is what's Hillary going to do? Uh, hi, Senator. My name is Jacob Schulman. Yes. Uh, I'm an you know, uh, undergraduate associate here. And first of all, thanks for coming to speak with us. And second of all, uh, a lot of us are graduating in about a month, and there's a large amount of us going to law school, going to graduate school, uh, going into business, going into government. So I wanted to ask you for one piece of ethical conduct um, advice and one piece of professional conduct advice for us. What's that? Oh. <laughs> oh, what, uh, hey, listen, let me tell you. What did... Political virtue is not only its own reward, that being peace of conscience and freedom from fear of exposure. You know, let me tell you something. I spent 40 years in this business. I never did anything that I thought was wrong, and I slept nice. Okay? Now, some people can sleep and do terrible things and sleep nice. You can just read about it down through history. We were talking about history earlier, and there are plenty of horrible, horrible things being done uh, in the Middle East right now, and people sleep fine. So it's all about who you are and what you're about. But I think, um, uh, see, there's two different problems. One is kind of um, trying to figure out what somebody's motivations is. And I think it's almost impossible to figure out. I mean, it's not impossible. It's difficult to figure out what someone's motivation is. This is one of the things that Vice President Biden used to say about civility in, in the Congress, is don't question another member's motives. You don't know what their motives are, OK? And you're probably wrong. And every time you question somebody's motives and you're wrong, you've got yourself a real live enemy for no good cause. 
So the real thing is, 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 is what's, what's in your heart. And what, just come up with your own set of ethics. Read about ethics and figure out what it is and then follow it. Um, I, had a, I did it not just for altruistic reasons. I just found I couldn't keep this stuff. I, I, I just couldn't keep all the stuff straight. So for me, it was, it was really an easy decision. And then when I was a senator, uh, you know, I was 72. Why wouldn't I do what I thought was right? Huh? <laughs> I mean, I mean I, and, I, and most members of Congress, they do what they think is right. We, we had that whole discussion, right? They just don't agree with me. John Bross doesn't agree with me, but that doesn't mean that he, he isn't doing what he thinks is right. It's just what I think is right. So I just think to your own self be true. I mean, you, you, it's, it's, something, it's one of the parts of, of, uh, of, um, of life. One of the things I talk to a lot of my students uh, and a lot of young people over the years on the kind of how do you, one of the, you know, these kind of considerations, and I, I tell them that one of the ways to figure, find happiness for yourself is there's a continuum. Just, there's lots of continuums. But there's one continuum which is, has Mother Teresa on one end of the continuum and Gordon Gecko from Wall Street on the other end of the continuum. And I find that people are pretty much hardwired where they are on that continuum. There's some nurture in it, but it's basically where they are. And you're going to be a lot happier if you can figure out as early as possible in your life where you are in that continuum. Some people can go off and spend their whole life doing nothing except making money. I know a lot of people like that. I've got a lot of friends like that. You know, that's what they like to do, and it works. And lots of people just want to do nothing except public service. That's what they do, public service, public service, public service. And that's going to make them happy and where, and, 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 and where they're going to go. And let me just tell you one argument for public service, OK? I'm 76 years old. All of you are going to live far beyond 76 at the rate we're going, or the vast majority of I you. Mean. When you get to your 60s and your 70s and your 80s, the fact that you were in public service and tried to do something to make the place a better world is very, a very good thing to have. It's not the bonus. It's not like the pension and the rest of that. But, you, you know, I know lots of people at this point in their lives are trying to figure out, what did I do with my life? Do you know what I mean? And Vice President Biden and I used to always have, when he was senator in 1973, we, used to, we were trying to find ourselves. We were riding back and forth on the train every day with then Congressman Florio. And it was, it was like, what did you do during the war, Daddy? There's a war out there. What did you do about it? Did you get in and try to fight for it? Whatever it is. I don't care if you're liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican, whatever you are. I get in there, I'm going to fight. I'm going to go, do something in public service. And by the way, the beauty of it is you don't have to accomplish anything. I mean, I, I, I think I accomplished some stuff. But I know one thing, I tried. I tried to do something. And boy, I feel good about that, OK? So that's, that's the best I can give you on, on, uh, on that question. You work it out. Hi, my name is Marilia Wyatt. I'm one of the 2015 undergraduate associates. Now, there are different perspectives out there that we are not living in unprecedented times these political events are cyclical. Um, so my question is, what is your um, solution to these political events for leaders like us that do want to create change um, and make a positive impact in our communities? What is your solution to this problem, to this dysfunction in Washington? Yeah, well, uh, I, as I said, I think it'll pass. I know it'll pass. It's just a matter of how long until it passes. I, think, I do believe that a lot of the problems now have to do with uh, the economy and people are hurting and they're angry. I mean, look, when we had the Great Depression, what happened? The whole country went left, right? I mean, the, all, the movement, all the movement in the country was, uh, it was the left of the spectrum. I know my, my father was that way. And, and that's where all the FDR, I mean, come on. Let's go back. Who, 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 what happened after the Great Depression? Everybody was mad as hell, and they, they, Woody Guthrie got on the guitar, and off we went. So this time it went right. And we can talk about that some other time. But, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic for this country. Uh, and, and I think I'm optimistic for the people in it. We're just, but I'm just saying, we're gonna, it's going to take a while to overcome this. You don't, you, if you make mistakes, you pay for them. And we made some, in my opinion, we made some mistakes recently. So we're going to have to pay for it. And a lot of it has to do with the economy. But I think all you can do is what you, you know, concentrate on you. Concentrate on what you can do for you that makes, that, makes, that makes you feel like you're making a difference 
and doing what you're doing. It, you know, I can hardly read the New York Times anymore and get up and I'm depressed, I'm depressed by the time I get to the fourth page reading about ISIS or whatever the issue or the issue of what's going on with the banks or whatever else it is. But you know, the other day I went out and served uh, lunches to uh, homeless people. Yeah, it didn't change the world. It wasn't a solution to anything. But you know what? I felt pretty good about it. So I think it's, it's it, fortunately for all of us, we each have our own personal things. There's a world out there, there's a lot going on, there's a lot of bad things going on, the rest of it. But you can make a, you know, it, it really, I hadn't thought about it this way, but really, with what's going on now, it's easier to make a difference right now uh, because there are, we're kind of in a bad patch. When we're in a real good patch, it's harder to make a difference. I mean, you make a difference, and the whole country is, is better. Hi, Senator. I'm Bonnie Kelter. I'm a graduate student in governmental accounting here at Rutgers. Um, I'm very intrigued by this uh, slide here. And I've had many encounters in talking to people about their party and their mm. ideology. And I find what th we talked about that you, you're voting your ideology. Um, what I have found that mixes people up a lot is the abortion and women's rights issues. So you have people that are firmly democratic. They, they believe in all those ideals, but they're very uh, religious and they believe abortion should not be legal. And that is their overriding ideology. So they vote Republican. And I've talked to many people that go the other way. Right. They're, they're strongly Republican, um, but they believe in a woman's right to choose, so they vote Democratic. I believe that that is the overriding ideology in all the other ideologies that's going to shape this nation, that people are voting that way, and who's going to be the majority voting yeah. is whichever is going to come out. And yeah. I believe that will be the swing into the next. Um, Maybe I mean the issues. I mean, look at look at gay marriage. Let me tell you something. I've been doing watching Poland for forty years. I've never seen an issue change so fast as gay marriage. I mean, I, it is in, it is absolutely. I mean, it is incredible. If you do if you look at national polling, that thing went from nowhere to everywhere instantly. I mean, it was just is absolutely remarkable. Um, so yeah, they, they, I mean, look. If you believe uh, that it's perfectly okay to have 1% of the people in America control 50% of the wealth or whatever that number is, I don't care what it is, I don't care what the number is, and, and you think that's the, way, that's the way the capitalism works and the rest of it, then what you want to do is you want to take people's eyes off the ball, which is the economic ball, and you want to start talking about social issues. West Virginia is a Republican state? Oh my, hey, how many here have ever been to West Virginia? Okay, could you believe, I mean, you drive through West Virginia, do you think these are Republicans? I saw a guy just like that out of my country club the other day. Or they look just like Mitt Romney. That guy looks just like Mitt Romney. <laughs> I mean, they wrote this wonderful book on Kansas. I can't remember, do you remember the one about yellow in Kansas? What's the matter with Congress? And, and what did they found? They found in Kansas, which should be a, a blue collar democratic state, a, a true blue democratic state is Republican, it's because of the social issues. I mean, it's, it's, it, there are things called wedge issues. They've been around for, uh, to really start, I guess, in the uh, 60s, uh, 70s. Um, so people are very good at, at using those issues, and people really care about them. Um, but I, I, don't, I, don't think, I, don't think, I don't think that's what's driving. I mean, that drives some folks. But I think if you look at the polling data, you're not going to find, you know, like 50% of the Republicans vote the way they do because of abortion or 50% of the Democrats vote the way they do in kind of abortion. Most people have a whole group of issues, that they may be ideological, group of issues that, you know, like they either think Hillary Clinton's great or they think Ted Cruz is great, you know? It, it isn't about what their position is. They just listen to him and they say, I really like Ted Cruz. I like Mitt Romney or I don't like Barack Obama. So I think that's... Uh, one of the differences now, or one of the realities now, whether it's different, is that people don't have any confidence or have limited confidence in governor, government's ability to fix anything. So even when people acknowledge that it's not right for right. income to be distributed the way it is, then the question is, well, can government fix yeah. that? And 
what, what's your experience or thoughts from the specific thing of, of the paperwork for government for presidential appointments or government right. appointments, but of things that could be done that would both increase government's ability to perform and and increase the perception of government's ability right. to perform. I think it's a perception. I think most of it's a perception problem. I, I believe that. I, when I was in the Senate, <clears throat> every week I go down on the floor and I pick out a, a what I call a great federal employee. And I would talk about that great federal employee and talk about their background and where they're from and what a great job they were doing, how well thought of them. I did over 100 of them uh, before I was finished. I mean, the federal government is full of great people. Um, now, the federal government is extraordinarily complex, folks. It is not just complex, it's extraordinarily complex. I mean, it is, I got, I got a, 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 with about a year to go, my two years, uh, Majority Leader Reed came to me and said, um, I'd like you to get on Homeland Security uh, Committee. I said, you know, I'm on two committees, I'm doing great, I like what it is, but I said, I, my basic rule was if Harry Reid asked me to do something, I did it. And so I went on Homeland Security. So I come to my first hearing in Homeland Security. Now, it's called Homeland Security, but it's the old Government Operations Committee. It looks at all the things that are going on in government. So I go to my first hearing, and uh, it's on some kind of arcane government issue. And uh, Joe Lieberman is the Democratic senator. He's the chair. And Susan Collins is a Republican ranking member. And they've got four government employees up there, and they're talking about this issue, and I spent 40 years in this business, and I understood about 20% of what they were talking about. You know, I mean, it, it, it is just so complex. So it's so easy for people to take and, and um, uh, uh, increase the perception of something wrong. The other thing is the media decided around 1975 or 80, that is, you know, if you don't have something on the news, what you can do is you can do this piece about what's wrong with the government. And you know what they do? It's really great. <clears throat> if you're working in the government, you're in a government agency, you know how many people are watching what you're doing? There's the White House. If you're in foreign policy, and national security advisor. If not, it's domestic counsel. There's the Office of Management and Budget, which approves all your budgets. Every time you speak before the Congress, it's got to be approved by the Office of Management and Budget. You've got a House Appropriations Committee, you've got a House Authorizing Committee, you've got a Senate Appropriations Committee, you've got a Senate Authorizing Committee. You've got the General, uh, uh, what do they call it? They used to call it General Accounting, General, and GAO. They, where any member of Congress can say, I want to find out what she's doing. You go find out for me. And every department's got an Inspector General. So it's easy to do these media stories. All you do is you go down and go to the Inspector General's office, and they come out with a report. You know, we did this report on Somewhere in, somewhere in the in the government, something was really screwed up, which the government can do. And you just take the report, and you got your story. You don't have to do investigative journalism. You don't have to go out and check. You don't have to go out to agencies and walk around and you know find out what's going on. Right? You just go to get the GAO, the Inspector General. You go to appropriate. You go to a House committee hearing. Look at Benghazi. Oh my God! They've had five committees now in the Congress. They're, they still got one going that says that nothing really bad was done at Benghazi. Okay. But what did that do to perception? And then they got, you know, I mean, it's, uh, so it's, it's, it, it, I, I believe it's mostly a perception problem. But it's in a lot of people's interest to have the government look bad. No regulations. Regulations are bad. I mean, the mass majority of Americans think federal regulations are bad. How do you think we got the great financial meltdown? How much do we spend? $30 trillion. Oh, this regulation costs money. How much did the meltdown cost? I guarantee you, all the regulations you can find in the whole world didn't make up one tenth of one thousandth of one percent of what we lost as a country in the financial crisis. So it's a it's a gigantic perception problem. And again, we get back to where's the money? Where's the money going to preach the idea the federal government doesn't work? <laughs> so I mean, it, you know, in the end, we figure it out. But there's a lot of, you know, the, you know there's an old thing about uh, in communications, the signal and the noise. You know, it's hard if you get a, if, you, if somebody's communicating to you and there's a whole lot of noise, where's the signal? How do I find the signal? Well, right now, there's a lot of, you know, noise. And so what you have to do, it's harder to find out where the signal is. We'll do it. Yeah. Oh, the director. 
I just, uh, Ruth Mandel, I just have to go back to your optimism because I'm standing yeah. here and it's going around and around and around. And I love it and I want to be optimistic and it's not that I'm not. But you're saying, if I heard you correctly, it's who we are. So what does that mean? Is it foundational vision? Is it the Declaration of Independence? Is it the set of laws? Is it the air we happen to breathe on this no. continent? Is it the kind of mix of people we have? I mean, what is that rooted in? Okay. Uh, because we and have is that so does that mean that, you know, Russia's always going to be Russia, right? We all know that. And if we go around the world and we look, yeah. it's just who they are. What does that mean? No, no, I don't, no, it's not the air we breathe and not who we are. And one of the great things that makes this country great is all the people that come in who are new. That's why immigration, I mean, everybody wants to talk about immigration reform and the rest of that. What makes this country great is immigration. I mean, just think about, you know, it's, it used to be so hard to get here. I mean, people came here. They had to be, they couldn't be risk averse, right? I remember Lynn and I were, we were driving through southwest Texas, southwest uh, part of the country. This is like 20 years ago. And we're going, you know, we're going like 75 miles an hour and it was 120 degrees outside and we hadn't seen a car for like, you know, 15 minutes. And we're thinking, oh my God, what happens if we get a flat tire or the air conditioning breaks? And you know what? Can you imagine being on a covered wagon? Can you imagine what those people were like? Do you know what it was like to come over here? On, you know, I, mean, I, I don't want to start going over, but I really believe this. We, we have, we, we, our founding fathers, and, 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 and of course, they founding, uh, they, they were men, but they, the founders, the people who made this country great, they came up with a hell of a system. This system really works. I mean, this is, we're the only place in the world that really protects political minorities. That's why I'm opposed to changing the filibuster. Um, uh, Irish Shapiro was mentioned earlier, who's a fantastic guy. He, I agree, Irish is one of my very good friends. And he and I don't agree at all on the filibuster. I, uh, but because we protect political minorities. We don't just protect racial minorities, ethnic minorities, all the different minorities. We protect political minorities. Anywhere else in this country, you get elected, and the first thing you do is you shoot all the guys and men and women who are on the other party. Or you throw them out of office, or you do whatever else it is. In this country, you can't do that. The, the Supreme Court will be there and say, you can't do that. You can't, you can't. Uh, so we have all these wonderful things that have been given to us. Um, and we have these incredible people, and we keep turning them over because they, they, the people keep wanting to come here. You look at some of the people on, for instance, Wall Street or Silicon Valley that, have, that came here in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years. And where else? And, then you t and, it, and I don't know how many have traveled around the world, but for instance, India. I remember when I was in India. You know, they say, and everywhere you go in the world, or many, many places you go in the world, the very best entrepreneurs are Indians. The only place in the world where an Indian can't be an entrepreneur is India. And that's the truth. I mean, India is just, it's a horror for an entrepreneur to get anything done. And China, yeah, I mean, you know, where are they going? I mean, okay, they're great and everything, they're big and it's all, you know, they're going to be great. But you know what? Maybe I went through the 70s, remember this, you remember the 70s, and you remember the Russians were 10 feet tall and their gross domestic product was growing at 4% a year and we weren't and they were going to take us over and then it was the Japanese, remember? In the 80s and 90s, the Japanese were taking over. Their gross domestic product was growing 20 or 20 percent. We were only doing like 5 or 6 percent, you know. And now it's the Chinese. Watch the Chinese, folks. You can't have a country that refuses to, you know, have a free Internet in this day and age, and you're going to be able to compete with a country that does. You're not going to be innovative. You're not going to be able to do these kinds of things. You can't throw people in jail the way the Chinese do. Now, their growth rate's been going pretty well. So I'm just saying, we, you know, uh, Churchill said, Democracy is a horrible form of government. It just happens to be better than any other. And we ain't perfect, and we got our problems, and it drives me crazy, as you can tell. I really don't care about this stuff. And, uh, but we're the best. We are the best. And there's so many places in the world where it's, they're going worse. I mean, if you, want, you can also look at the other side and say, why are so many of these countries, like look what happened in Egypt? What, you know, I mean, so I'm optimistic, but I'm not optimistic like tomorrow and the next day. <laughs> I just, in the end, uh, um, we will make it work. And I think one of the driving forces will be making it work if we can get that right direction thing up to, you know, 50 or 60 percent. I'll, I'll tell you, when I, get, when I left the Senate working for, for uh, then Senator Biden in 1995, and I was teaching down at Duke. At that time, I was teaching at the law school. I was living down there and teaching. And um, 
the, the, the professor that got me involved was a professor named Chris Schrader in the law school. He first got me to come down there. And uh, he and I started a center for the study of the Congress. At that point, the approval rating for the Congress was 1995. So for the previous three years, Newt Gingrich, who is a genius uh, at Revolution, had managed for the first time in 40 years for Republicans to win the House of Representatives. And the way he did it was he just ripped government, ripped government, ripped government, ripped government. Now, the Democrats in the House, it was time for them to go. 40 years is just too long. I don't know, Jim, I'm not going to ask you for your comments on that, but, but I, it, was, it, was not a it was not a great place as far as I'm concerned back then. A lot of good people, but um, anyway. Uh, so, you know, I just look, looked at, 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 at what happened. So we put this thing, and the approval rating of Congress then was now, it's, being, it's getting back to where it was. It was like 12 or 13 percent. So we started a Center for the Study of the Congress. And our basic theme was it's okay to be skeptical of the Congress, but you shouldn't be cynical. The cynicism is corrosive, skepticism is right. That's what our founding fathers wanted the rest of it. So, so you know what happened? So night, we started January 1st, 1995. The Republicans came in January 1995. 1996, 97, 98, the approval rating of Congress goes up, 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 you know, and it goes up to now it's like 30% or 35%, and we had to close down the thing because there wasn't any problem anymore. And you know why it went up? Because Newt Gingrich got to be Speaker of the House, and he stopped beating up on the government. In my opinion, that's, that's, I may be wrong, but there was, the, you know, he, he, they had been so successful. And, and by the House, we had the banking scandal, we had all these other things go on. But um, a lot of it is just, you know, is, is, is it, it, we got to get it back. And, and it will come back. And the public, for instance, you're, in my opinion, there's a gigantic change now the Republicans control the House and Senate. You know, they're now government. I mean, for, you know, so there's less and less incentive for them to, now there are some folks that are beating up on it. But it's going to take time. I mean, it's, it, 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 as I said, it's going to take time. The financial crisis was a gigantic political crisis and the difference between a financial crisis. It just, it just really did hurt us as a country. It made people rightfully more concerned about where their next meal was coming from, what was going to happen to their parents or what was going to happen to their children. It was more about whether they were going to have a house to live in, uh, was going to, whether they were going to have a job, whether they were going to have a good job. I mean, one of the things people don't talk about is, one of the things amazing for me is, people used to, when I started out, people go to work and they go to work for a company they stay for 30 years. <laughs> my sons-in-laws and, and my daughter, three daughters and their, their husbands, they stay someplace for two years. They're like nuts. What am I, you know, oh my God, I gotta, you know, this is, I've learned everything I learned, I'm gonna move out of it. So how do you think people feel that still have a job, but are stuck in a job that they should have left two, three, four, five years ago because of the fact that they've stopped learning, but they can't go. So in Disney unemployment, you've got all these folks who are, have a job, but are not happy in their job, but can't leave their job. So there's a lot of anger out there, there's a lot of angst, things will get better, I think, as the economy comes back. John? 